What do we think about this little girl? She amazing. Sean, you want to play some music while we get the next hit? Which one? Okay, you guys, we got porta potties are over there. There's food. All the food trucks, lunchtime food trucks are right behind me. So food and potty, we're going to take just a little bit of break. Oh, I love it. I love it. Why? Why? I just love to see the American USA. spirit here. USA. I love to see Trump supporters USA. here. Like-minded individuals. USA. That's what I like. USA! USA! 100 percent Right down the middle. 5248. Which, which is 52? Red. I think that the votes were suppressed. I think we got more votes than they let us know. So what's gonna happen? How are Americans survive that? Four more years of Trump. We'll be good. We gotta get somebody in after him, though. We can't let our country just go down. Hey, Genevieve. Brother, I'm here. Looking great. Awesome. Good job. Where are you? Are you uh, AP News or something? No, no, I just have a YouTube channel. I put it up. Beautiful. Tell me your name and where you're from. My name's Jeffrey Eric. I'm from Sacramento, California. Thank you very much. My page, my page is the Prudent Patriot on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you. This is my Trump supporter shirt that I made myself. I am literally, as far as I'm aware, one of the very few anarchist Trump supporters in existence. What makes you an anarchist? Simple. I don't like being told what to do by my government. Say it again. I am 
as far as I'm aware, one of the only Trump-supporting anarchists in existence. And what makes you an anarchist? I don't like to just blindly listen to the government. You know, we fought the British so we could have self-determination and independence. I'm all for that. You know, that's why I support the president. He's anti-establishment. The thing he did in his first day of office, he got rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He told us, all right, we're going to try and get American independence back up and running. I like that. It's perfectly fine. He's trying to improve our economy, and as far as what he's trying to do with our general rights and stuff, he's trying to make it so that free speech can be for everyone. Because we've had a dialectic divide, he's trying his best to bridge that. That's why, in the run-up, when he was doing the whole, you know, going from state to state to state to state, that's why five times, five crazies tried to kill him. It's because he's going against the status quo, he's going against the grain, and that's why, however far you want to go in with the conspiracy with the radical left versus the radical right, that's why the radical left is consolidating everything and trying to get rid of any form of dissidence, you know? So there's a split in the United States. Yes. Ex describe that to me and how that impacts you. The way it impacts me is there's a lot of events I can't really go to anymore, and the sad thing is I have to worry about being around anarchists of other groups because the sad thing is because of the fact that it's become another left versus right paradigm, just because of the fact that Trump's in office, it, 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 it makes things hectic. I used to be able to go to May Day without having any trouble, because I'm from Chicago. Now, a lot of people support and you know take part in May Day because of uh, you know the Soviet Revolution. In Chicago, we're not the same. We actually had uh, what we call the Haymarket Affair that happened. And I go to that one because there, was, there were several people that were involved in not just the American anarchist movement, but the labor union as well. They were trying to get workers' rights and such going. And eight innocent individuals got hung because of the Haymarket Affair, which basically, it was a giant rally that happened, the mayor was cool with it, the cops were kind of queasy about it. Long story short, somebody, the, one of the last speakers, August Spies, basically said, F this, F that, F this, F that. And then uh, a, a small scuffle occurred, a guy threw a pipe bomb in there. And uh, yeah, basically him and everyone else got hung for it. And it's, I used to like actually having, having a nice discussion with people of different politics and that, because I like being diplomatic nowadays. Everything's become such a rigid divide where it's either you're for and against, you know? It's, now, it's, are you also like a, a punk or are you like, you know, I mean like, you know, a, a, your, oh. what, what's your taste in music? Uh, gothic, industrial, heavy metal, jazz, blues. I mean, I'm from Chicago. You gotta love the blues and the jazz, you know? It's got a real deep soul in our city. And uh, I do actually like classical music. I like big band. You know, I like to listen to that every now and again, but typically I'm just straight up like industrial and heavy metal. And what, what, what newspapers do you read or what websites do you visit? Uh, I normally don't read, read the newspapers too much anymore because they all seem the same to me. As far as uh, websites, what I'll do is, uh, I'm a big fan of Infowars. I like listening to them. I, you gotta filter through a little bit of the showmanship they have to get, uh, to get to the news of what they're doing, but I like them. I like Louder with Crowder, especially for the entertainment. The thing that's good is like, even if you don't want to go through, sift through all the news and stuff that uh, Steven Crowder and them have, it's really good entertainment because it's uh, the television. There's not really much good news, in my opinion. You now, know? how did you? What did you think of Obama compared to Trump? What I thought. There's a good thing between the two of them because here's the thing that I th find ironic. Both of them are paradoxical to each other. Obama's a very good speaker. He's a very confident man. He can sell you an idea that'll be the worst idea in the world, and he will sell it to you as the best idea ever. He was a very good speaker, but a very poor planner. President Trump the other way around, you know, he will talk to you and, you know, he may not sound like he's, you know, the best salesman, but he can actually make a great deal. Let's walk over here, these guys are talking a little too loud. Sure. All right, okay. so he's talking a great game. Yes. So, so what sort of things do you like the best? Now this, this NAFTA thing, Yes. I mean, also Bernie Sanders was against it. What's the difference between the way the socialists were against it and the way Trump is against NAFTA? The difference between the socialists and the Trump supporters with getting rid of NAFTA is the socialists, the direction they wanted to go with is they wanted to more so have NAFTA streamlined to where it would support the workers because their general idea was union labor, which I'm all for, you know, it builds great cities. The only thing was is because the politics in there, it would become troublesome because we have that happen in Chicago a lot. Is where, yes, you want union labor, you want the union to be involved in a lot of stuff because it's skilled workers. You want skilled workers to build things, and if NAFTA is going to be a trade deal, 
you want people to know what the hell they're doing. It's simple as that. That was more of the socialist direction where they wanted they wanted it streamlined and they wanted it to a degree centralized. Whereas uh, what does it mean uh, streamlined and centralized? What I mean by streamlined and centralized is from the socialists I've spoken to. What they basically wanted is they wanted the individual labor unions and some of the companies and organizations that they worked with to be involved in the renegotiation. And they wanted it streamlined as in, okay, there's a diplomatic agreement between all the different worker unions, all the different companies. So, And once that agreement is made, then basically that becomes the standard for the entirety of the country or the entirety of this sector of production or that sector of production. So they got that far. Yeah, that was that was the plan. Now, if that happened or not, I don't really know. All I know is that was the general plan that they had. That they being the the Sanders the, people. Yeah, the Sanders and the socialists. Yeah, and the socialists. that's that's what I'm aware they of. They wanted to make. They wanted to say it again. They wanted to get the workers to participate in. Yeah, they wanted the workers to participate in the negotiations because what they're because the the, the old socialist thing is you know. The, each according to his labor, each according to his means. Which, yes, they're a bit more Marxist with it than your regular persons in that it's socialism. It is what it is. When you say each according to his labor, each according to his means, that's uh, the needs or means. Uh, e uh, means. And what does that mean for for the socialists in that? For them, as far as I understand, how they have worked that interpretation is it's if you're down on your luck, if you're you're needing more income. They'll take some income from some of the other workers and it's, and uh, give it to them. So if you have, let's say, an illness that's more severe than someone else, should you get the same amount or should you get enough to take care of that illness? I'd say enough to take care of the illness. And now, in terms of the uh, Trump NAFTA plan, yes. how does that differ from the socialists? The way the Trump NAFTA plan differs from the socialists is Trump's going about it from an administrative perspective. Now, he's basically the opposite end of the socialists. The socialists are going through workers, unions, companies. Trump's trying to reorganize it from his entire cavity. He's trying to have the government that he's now operating redo it. So does that mean, I mean, as opposed to the socialists, which have the workers participating in the negotiations, with Trump, he's going to be the negotiator. Is that what you're saying? From my understanding, yes. He is trying to go and negotiate it from the Oval Office. He does, as far as I know, he does have the interests of the workers in mind because he's not anti-labor. He's not anti-labor unions because a lot of the work he's done in New York is done by labor unions. So that's a good thing. Well, he has no choice. Yeah, oh, naturally, yeah. If you're in a city like New York and Chicago, yeah, you got to go through the union to get things done. That is, that is how it is. But, I mean, and he has to negotiate with the workers. Yes, he does have to negotiate with the workers and the unions. The thing is, because of the uh, the stigma, that divide that's there, the socialists really don't trust Trump, and Trump's not too sure if he trusts the socialists. Because, well, we're talking about the workers now. Yes, I'm sorry, yes, yes. As far as, like, the regular workers, yeah, because they're, it, it's a real pain in the ass because it's, it's almost like a two, three-quarter divide. And the thing is, a lot of the parties are having trouble negotiating with each other because no one's really sure if they can trust the other. And that's that's kind of the difficulty because, yeah, Trump's trying to get rid of NAFTA because he's like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. I want to make it fairer for all of the workers. I want to make it fairer for the nation so we're not paying as much out of pocket, which, yes, well, But he wants sense. to do that without consulting the workers or from his ivory tower, who, who is he going to talk to? As far as I'm aware of who he's going to talk to, he's going to talk to different countries that are involved in NAFTA. As far as I'm aware, he is going to discuss it with the workers because the guy is a New York businessman. He needs to work with the labor unions, and he has worked with them in the past, so it would make sense that he continues to work with them. It. It's just he's going, instead of going from bottom up, he's going from top bottom. Now, is the country coming together, or is it dividing up even more? I would hope that it's coming together because there has been, there, there, there is some hope that we are settling some differences. That's a good thing about more, is it's, it's breaking the divide. And there are more events like this that I see popping up. The only thing that disheartens me to say that I think things are getting a bit worse is the sectarian violence keeps occurring. It's not occurring as, as often and as fierce as it did in the in last year and the year before, but it's still sadly reoccurring. And well, what about just in terms of public opinion polls and in like, uh, you know, just families having discussions? How's the discussion in your family? Ah, uh, with my family, I talk, I basically give them the long story short of it because I am very long winded. <laughs> and most of them, they're either they're OK with them or they really don't care about it, because the sad thing is people are sometimes afraid to talk about it because they're either worried to piss somebody off or start a fist fight with somebody 
or it's like, oh, you know, it, it turns into like a the the old the old thing in the cartoons where the puppets are beating the crap out of each other. Yeah. And, Tell me about your T-shirt. Oh, I made this last year uh, when I came to Moore. I gave a speech here last year about how I wanted to prevent the cataclysm that's going on in the country. And I painted this up myself in a particular fashion to represent all of the general groups I'm a part of. Because I am a Trump supporter and I am an anarchist, so I did MAGA, Make America Great Again, in my own regular type of font. And I put thought criminals up here because that, back then, last year and the year before, that's generally how most of us who were against the general establishment and were going, all right, Trump seems to be okay. We're, uh, we're almost done. All right, thank you very much. Tell me your name and where you're from. Uh, my name's Glenn Meyer. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Okay, Glenn. Pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. What kind of political following do you have? Is it more left, right, both in the middle? What? So I, I cover a lot of these events, and I, I cover uh, also events dealing with religion and with um, hey guys. GMO hey, stuff, and you know, like really contentious issues. I mean, like I'm interested in the divide that's happening in America, documenting the, the, the split that's going on. And I want you to talk something about what's going on in the United States and what can bring it together. But one of the things is I'm facing towards the speaker, meaning the noise. So if you can, if I, if you can stand here. Yeah. Because this is a fairly directional mic. All right. All right. So, tell me about. Tell me about. Tell me about your mission, restoring hope. Hello, my name is Alan Duff, retired Army major, and I just finished this book that just came out today called Restoring Hope Across America. We've been given the motto of hope and change, and this is more about hope and restore of our fundamental values of which our nation was founded on. As we go forward as a nation, I think it's important for us to look at, are we going to be a nation that looks at socialism and all those different ideas, or are we going to be a nation that kind of goes back to limited government and cultural unity and how we get along with each other? It's very frustrating that we live in a nation that's so divided right now. So how would you contrast the difference now between the government we had under Obama and the government we have now? Well, we look at our presidents in so many ways, um, but one of the things I talk about is government is at so many different levels. When we have the average American paying taxes to 17 different taxing authorities, sometimes we take our eye off really the, the important pieces, our governors, our city mayors and county commissioners and stuff like that. I think the main difference right now is we're, a lot of people are tired of politicians and think that's one reason why Donald Trump won, because he's a non-politician and it's ruffling the feathers of the swamp that he's taking on. And there's a lot of people that are upset with that. There are a lot of people upset with Donald Trump, with uh, President Obama because he took us in a different direction than where we were headed before. So. We're at a very critical time as a nation. Where are we going as we go forward? It's going to be a cultural fight for it. I want to see us get along. My hope is not to see necessarily a red America for Republicans or a blue uh, America for Democrats, but a red, white, and blue America where we're all fighting for the same thing, for a great country. So how do we do that? Because the rhetoric is very, is very uh, cutting on both sides. Everyone feels offended by what the other side is saying. We have to learn to talk peaceably with each other and learn to get along even if we fundamentally disagree. I love talking to my liberal friends who really want more government and just say, let's talk about what do you want and try to come to an understanding. What I find is that we argue over some petty things sometimes. And what we really need to, need to do is figure out what do we agree on. What do we agree on? Security for our nation. Most people want that for their family and their children. How do we go about it? That's where sometimes you know the challenges come in politics. Yeah. I can hear you. I am.
Is this, uh, is this for the wall? Yep, fundthewall.com. How much do you need? About 25 billion is the latest estimate I've seen. How many? 20 to 25 billion, isn't that right? Yeah, around there. <laughs> so, how much have you gotten today? Uh, fair amount. I mean, we've probably got into four figures, I would think. There's definitely people coming out to show up and want to donate. But the idea was that the, the Mexicans were supposed to fund it. Well, there's one thing about Mexico giving money into the general treasury, but it's another thing for Congress to actually appropriate the money. So, if, to build the wall. Right, exactly. Wait a second. When, what was Trump's number one promise? That Mexico was going to pay for it. I like it so much. I mean, so he didn't mean that. I'm sorry? He didn't mean that. I, Mexico can reimburse the general treasury. The money can ultimately come from them, but while we're waiting, there's no reason to wait for them to show up and start paying for it, right? And in addition to that, the method that we found takes away the need for Congress to actually appropriate any money. We can get money directly to DHS that goes around the appropriations process. So where is that, where is that money going to come from? American people. So are you willing to raise taxes? No, of course not. That wouldn't be a tax. That's so not a taxing you, issue. So you're going to like take it, you're going to build a deficit? No, the American people are donating to this. It's willful voluntary donations. Small donations, we take them, we put them all together, and then we take one big donation and give it right back to It's going to be DHS. modular. It's going to be modular. Right to Have DHS, you. so Congress can't touch it. Now what design do you like for the wall? The one that's going to hold up. <laughs> I like the one with the blue metal at the top, where it starts out concrete at the bottom, and then it goes to the blue... Uh, to the blue metal part that's got the lines and a little circle at the top. That one to me seems unclimbable. But they all look pretty good. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if they want to donate, where do they send the money? Fundthewall.com. Fundthewall.com. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. What does this uh, poster represent to you? The American system of political economy. And how, how does, who are those three people? Well, that's Abraham Lincoln, that's Donald Trump, and that's Lyndon LaRouche. Now, now this guy LaRouche, who, is he like a... And I can give you a leaflet, but I can't say any more. Why not? I can't say any more. I the leaflet, go ahead. Can I ask you a question? Can I find out what, uh, what why you're here? What, 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 who Lyndon LaRouche is? I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, uh, why not? It's really weird because I get excited to be here with this one of the most corrupt cities in the world. Without a doubt, one of the most corrupt cities. Uh, about, and if you're somebody that you want to speak out against these politicians in D.C., you want to do that in Portland, it's going to take some real courage. You want to see
because I want to keep our Constitution in place and I want to keep America great. Now let's get to that, that saying, keep America great. And I'm gonna end on this, and I've been ending on this for a while. You know, everybody talks about this phrase and demonizes this phrase, right, this phrase right here, keep America great. I talked to an individual on social media one time, and that person asked me, she said, when was America ever great? This was my response then, and this is my response now. America was great at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was a terrible loss. Just but it inspired a nation to drive it on in the revolution. Just America was great so, then. America was great when George Washington forced the defeat of York State and the, forced the surrender and the capitulation there. America was great. America was great at the Battle of Fredericksburg when American soldiers had to pile their dead on top of each other to hide themselves from Confederate bullets. America was great in that terrible moment. America was great at the great victory at Gettysburg and at the capitulation at Appomattox Courthouse. America was great in the smoke and flames of Pearl Harbor when 2,600 American sailors lost their lives and this nation was thrown into the midst of a terrible world war. And America was great at that moment. America was great the day we dropped the bomb on, ja on Japan and ended that war. America was great. America was great at Quezon and Port Top Hill. It was great in Iraq and Afghanistan because it's always been great. It's never not been great. This is the greatest nation on earth. The problem is we have far too many politicians who take the shining light of America and try to hide it under a rock and extinguish it for all time. We've got a president in office right now that's got that shining light set up on his shoulders. We need to raise him up on, his, on our shoulders so that light can shine bright and that light can shine strong. And we need to let this country, the socialists in this country, and we need to let the world know that America is great and we, continue, we are going to continue to renew that pledge to make America great over and over and over again. The hell of high water. Thank you very much. Suppression, we don't run from rain, right. and we don't run from tyranny.
Donald Trump has attempted to ban Muslims from the United States of America. So Donald Trump has sided with the Ku Klux Klan over people true. who demonstrated That's against lie. the Ku Klux Klan. That's not a lie. That is a it's lie. an absolute truth. Who did David Duke endorse? David Duke and Duke. David Duke did he not endorse? I believe so. So this is a permanent First Amendment demonstration area. Definitely. Okay, would they have a permit for this area? Absolutely. If you would like to set up a counter demonstration, a counter First Amendment I'm demonstration. I'm just walking through, sir. All right, then we can go. Right, we can right. go over there and we can set you up in an area. All right, if, you're just passing, if you're just passing through, that's fine. Yeah. We just. My I'm wife and I were visiting the Capitol. Yeah. Happened to encounter that this situation. Fine. All I'm saying is they have a permanent area. Okay. That, that, for their demonstration, if you'd like to set up a counter, we can put you in another area. I don't need to set up a counter. You can't be in the middle of theirs. So if you're walking through, that's great. Okay. Where would you like me to walk to, officer? If you're just walking. Through, that's fine. Walk okay. through. If you stop in their permanent area, okay, okay. and we cause a confrontation, I can establish another First Amendment area for you in view of theirs okay. to have it, to have your counter protest if that is what you wish. Yeah, I'm not trying. I just wanted to have a conversation with these people, but I understand, sir. What do, you, what do you have to say to them? Uh, I have nothing to say to them. We're here to have a great Patriot rally. They're welcome there to our free speech, but we're going to go back to doing what we're doing, which is having a great day. What does it mean to you to be an American? It means everything to me to be an American. This is the greatest country on earth. We are the country that is by, of, and for the people. We are the first nation that is governed by the people, and we are going to be that nation forever. And how united are the people in the United States now? Well, we've got a little bit of angry leftists. But we got a whole lot of Americans who love their freedoms, who love this country, and we may differ on political party or policy, but we we agree on one thing: we are all Americans. And what does it mean if we're all American? What does it mean to that guy who is just like uh, yelled he's, at? He's here to he's here to have free speech, and we're here to have free speech. Actually, the answer to speech you don't like is more speech, but we want to keep doing what we're doing. What does that mean, keep doing what? What are you doing? Keep, keep having a good time, enjoying our freedoms and enjoying this beautiful day in the park. Why do you think the country is so much more divided now than ever before? The media. How, how does that work? Why is the media... The so media good? continues to tell lies. It continues to give a voice to domestic terrorists who want to frighten us from using our free speech. And who, who are the domestic terrorists? Well, I think people like the Communist Party here in the country, like Antifa, who literally call for the overthrow of this president and the downfall and destruction of this constitutional republic. Do you think the, uh, the Communist Party is still funded by the Russians? I think it's funded by the globalists and the big bankers who are controlling a lot of what we see in the media right now today. Now, what are some of the names of these big bankers and globalists? Well, the Rothschilds, the, the Soros, uh, there's a, a whole bunch. What, the ones you got to worry about are the ones that have more money than Soros, and we never say their names. So, now, how do you think the president is doing, standing up to those? 
banking interest? I think he's doing fantastic. I think these bilateral agreements that he's working out with each nation literally undermines the globalist agenda to move us all into a global collectivist ideology. And what we are saying is that we're Americans and every nation has the right to sovereignty. So it's not just that we're saying we have the right to sovereignty, but when we negotiate directly with the Chinese or the Mexicans or the Canadians, each one of those countries have the right to their own national sovereignty. And that's why we can have a bilateral agreement because they're a nation and we're a nation and we can communicate and agree on things. Now, do you think we can compete with the Chinese? Yes. And then how? Man, we have competed with the Chinese for years. The only time we started losing competition to the Chinese is when we started being dragged in by these globalists into these large things like the TPP, which luckily the president took us out of. But these large multinational agreements that because we, we as America has always been an economic superpower, a lot of these agreements were designed to undermine the United States. And so when we're on a level playing field with the Chinese, we can compete. They, there's enough money and prosperity and capitalism for everyone. I just want to ask you about uh, the cultural divide. Is there a cultural war going on? Yes. And what are the issues in this cultural Well, war? I think the cultural war is we have a bunch of people who have changed their model. It used to be okay to just, a, when you had a candidate you didn't agree with, you could be very angry and vitriolic. But what we've changed in this country because of the left's response and resistance to this president is we're attacking individual voters. And that's what has to change. We have to go back to having civil disagreement, civil debate, and being a civil nation under the Constitution. Now, when I think of cultural wars, I think of like gays or, or transgender people or, or uh, you know, uh, equal, equal rights. I mean, uh, you don't think that, that fits into I think women, I, women getting more power over, you know, men thinking that women are I getting more power? I think this president has been great for that. In fact, there are a bunch of transgendered, wonderful patriots here today. There are wonderful women patriots here today. There are wonderful gay patriots here today. Our good friend, my good friend Andre Soriano, who designed the MAGA dress, wonderful gay American patriot, and we love him. The, the patriot movement, the pro-Trump movement is the most diverse political movement we've seen in, our, in my lifetime, and I'm 47 years old, so that's not a huge lifetime, but it's pretty good. And we, we embrace everyone who is willing to embrace the Constitution and what America's about. So, who doesn't embrace the Constitution? Who's the enemy? Collectivists. Who are the collectivists? Well, the people who want who want to believe that we need giant government, that we need the government to pay for everything, that we need the government to be the nanny state, and the, and the bankers and globalists that back them. Now, the, now the, the, the government paid for your tax cut by borrowing money for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've gone into greater deficit yes. because of that. Yes. I mean, so... You're getting money back from the government. Where's that money coming from? It, unfortunately, it comes from decades of politicians who have robbed Peter to pay Paul. They've robbed the Social Security Fund to pay for putting gravy money in their crony pocket. It comes from crony capitalism and from allowing corruption to get in our government. And that's what these patriots are here to speak against. That's why we elected Trump. We elected somebody outside the system to change that. So when people talk about crony capitalism, they're talking about capitalists who've corrupted the government. And they've corrupted capitalism. And they've corrupted Because what? that is not pure capitalism. In fact, it's literally, to use the word capitalism is a misnomer because it's more like fascism. It is more like a cooperation between business and government that takes power out of the way of the people. Capitalism is a free market system where anybody with hard work and an idea and gumption can build a business, build a product, have a job, and keep what they own, keep what they earn. That's what capitalism is really about. Real capitalism, not the kind of capitalism that goes on sometimes in this swamp. I mean, I, I guess the swamp is something that enriches some capitalists over others. Yes. So you want a fair playing field. That's right. So you support regulations to keep that fair. I support, I support, well, much like the president's tariffs, I support using the government to ensure that the free market and the fair and equal playing field for each American individual who wants to participate in that free market is available to them. So you think the government may have fa failed us? Uh, I think the government has failed us for decades, and that's why so many people got so angry and elected an outsider president. So which government agencies would you like to empower to keep um, the, the reins of power over these uh, cap 
uh, big capitalist groups that are corrupting the government. Well, I think we really need to look at restoring Glass-Steagall. I think we really need to look at how we are handling the uh, the federal uh, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. I, need, we, I think we need to audit the Fed and find out what they're doing there. Unfortunately, the bodies that should be protecting us are often already infected by that cronyism. And until we get that swamp drained, using those agencies to enforce our laws just ends up being more favoritism for the wrong people. Now, have you been disappointed by some of uh, Donald Trump's selected people who seem to have emerged out of the swamp and, and sort of infested it more? Uh, I'm, not I'm, I'm not disappointed because I thought that I, that I expected. I expected to see the swamp is very deep and its fingers are very penetrating and it's very hard. You know, when you're running something as large as the United States government, it's very hard to have every perfect person. But I, I respect and I appreciate that But my president has, when he sees somebody who is not right for the job, he is happy to let them go and move on, as other presidents have been in the past. As other presidents have been in the past. Now, is there anything that would lead, lead you to lose faith with the president? If he's, like, really implicated in... Uh, uh, some kind of a collaboration with the Russians. We have spent Russians. millions and millions and millions of taxpayer dollars on a witch hunt that has turned up with no hard evidence, no criminality. The president has in no, they have no proof the president has broken the law. At the same time, we have seen Hillary Clinton. We know her emails went to the Chinese. We know she bleach bit her computer. We know she's been hiding what she was doing for, for, probably most of her tenure as Secretary of State. So when we see real crimes, we're being ignored. But when we, but the president is attacked at every level with no evidence of criminality whatsoever. Now about 20 people in the Trump administration, in and out, have been indicted. How many, how many Hillary people have been indicted? Isn't that a good question? Isn't that a good question? Who, who? Because we're talking, for, for example, let's talk about Paul Manafort for a minute. The things that they, they spent millions of our dollars to investigate, uh, uh, so-called fraud that happened prior to his involvement in the president's campaign altogether. In fact, when he was working for the Podesta group, which is a Democratic group, under the under the, the same people who are working with Hillary Clinton and her administration and her Democratic side. So, you know, it's very funny that the only thing they can find wrong happened under the Democrats. Well, he's not the only one. There are, you know, there I mean, are a some lot. Some guy was just sentenced yesterday. We have a, you know, it's funny. He's lying to the FBI. Well, you know, the FBI lied to the FISA court. When are we going to see that? When are we going to see what Bruce Orr did? When are we going to see what happened with Lisa Page? When are we going to see why they lied about the Russian dossier and claimed that it was an independent information when, in fact, it was a paid piece of information by the Democratic Party? That's the, that's the corruption we need to talk about, and we're not indicting those do, people, do believe, and that's a problem. Do you believe the president can pardon himself? That's it. I am not a legal scholar, but I don't think he will need to do that. Because I don't think they have any capacity to impeach the president. They don't have the votes. They don't have the evidence. And they certainly don't have the will of the people behind well, it. Well, they haven't issued their report. They, 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 they have a hope to destroy a president that is bringing down their machine. And they're not going to succeed. Who's they? The left, the people, the, imp the resistance, the people who scream impeach 45 all day long. But they're also apparently within his own administration. I mean, no, I mean, no, 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 no. So when you tell me who the anonymous source is, you let me know. I I'm gonna have a good day. Have a good day. And, and uh, well, there's a bunch of them. That should all be locked up with Hillary. That we, as law-abiding, gun-toting Americans, are branded as terrorists. I don't think the NRA, any NRA member has been a terrorist. And it's because of uh, bullies like CNN's Minister of Propaganda, David Hogg, and Emma Gonzalez, that we are branded as murderers. I was at the March for Our Lives rally. That was not a march for our lives, that was a march for gun control. Do not be fooled. They are doing one thing and one thing only, and they are coming to take our guns away. And are we gonna let them take our guns away? Hell no! I tell them, let them come for my guns, for my cold dead hands, that's what I have to say. Am I right? So I ask you, Patriots, to keep up the good fight, keep up hope, because we have Donald J. Trump on our side, 
and I'm ready for another four years, six years with President Trump. Come this November, go out, vote, vote for Republicans who are going to save our country so that Donald Trump has another six years ahead of him. Thank you all so very much for coming out here today. God bless you all. God bless President Donald J. Trump. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. USA, USA. Georgia State Leader and Brand Ambassador of the Whiskey Patriots, Marjorie Green. In a government, we are guaranteed the right to bear arms and make a state militia so that they do not run us over. Okay, so guess what I'm talking about today? I'm going to be talking to you all about the deep state while we all stand literally in the swamp, which is Washington, D.C. Okay, so the deep state is a topic that we all used to whisper about. If you talked about it, you kind of whispered close with your friends and you'd say, the deep state. But now this is something that over 70% of Americans on both sides of the political aisle believe in. Democrats and Republicans alike 
all admit that they believe that there is a deep state. So what is the deep state? The deep state is an establishment, if you will. It is a group of people that expand into many organizations and many parts of our society. The deep state is not just a government organization, as you'll hear some people define it as, but instead it's more of like a fabric that has taken over in our country. And so I'll compare it, if you will. If many of you, some of you may be from the South and you might know what kudzu is. Well, kudzu is a vine that will take over. And kudzu was planted starting in the 1930s through the 1950s by farmers in the Southeast of America. Well, kudzu, they were told, would hold the ground so there wouldn't be soil erosion. And so they were encouraged to plant it. And the farmers did, they did plant it. And then guess what? In a short time, they found out that kudzu was a lethal vine that would crawl and take over everything and kill everything that it covered. It would cover their land, cover their trees, and choke it out. And that is exactly what kudzu does. Well, let me tell you something. Kudzu is just like the deep state. Because the deep state, it has its roots in the very fabric of our society. It's in our government. It's in our culture. We see it in Hollywood. It's in our media. And it's in every single thing that influences America. The deep state is different, different from, say, a tree that grows healthy. The deep state, it grows within our society to tear down the fabric of America, to take away our freedoms, and to change us throughout our culture. The deep state tries to tell us that there's more than one gender, more than boy and girl, that there's many genders, which is wrong. The deep state tries to influence you through media and through culture and through the news and tells you a message that you're divided where instead you're united as the American people. The deep state tries to tell you that white people hate black people and that white people hate Hispanics and that blacks and Hispanics hate one another and they divide you. The deep state tries to take control of the decisions in our government and it guides its processes. Until, until 2016, the deep state had a 16 year plan that was meant to destroy America and eight years of it had already happened through the Obama administration. In 2016, all of us, we elected Donald J. Trump for president. And when we did that, history changed. You see, there was something, there was something you have to know. She was never supposed to lose. She was guaranteed, guaranteed her place as president. She was guaranteed to win. She had everyone behind her. She had the DNC. She had the media. She had the celebrities, Hollywood. Are you going to be here tomorrow? She had all the money. Yeah, I'm going to be here Monday. Are you going to be here Monday? Tomorrow, 9 a.m. until 10 p.m. Oh, yeah, down to Lincoln. Yeah, down to Lincoln Memorial. And then Monday, and then Monday we're doing a march from the Lincoln Memorial to the White House, to the FBI American building, people, we and then we're going to end up, at the north side of the National Mall. Anymore. And so all of you, all of us together, we came together with hope and on a wing and a prayer, we voted for Trump in 2016. Thank God, thank God he won. And that's something that's real. He didn't cheat his way into office. He was elected by all of us. And you know what? That brought hope back to America. That brought hope back to every single one of you, me, and our children, and our future, future generations for this country. Now, there's something you have to know. 2016, he won, but it's not over. It is not over. If you don't believe this, and I, I tell you I believe it with all my heart, and I, I'm a person, if you know me, I'm on Facebook, I do live videos, I write articles, but here's what you need to know. I got sick and tired of not speaking the truth. And I believe all of you feel the same as I do. We want to speak the truth. And when we hear it, it is like sweet whispers to our ears. 
you can't ignore the truth and you have to speak it because here's what's happening we are in a fight it is a live or die fight and that's what's happening in november and if all of us do not rally up the same way we did in 2016 and get out there and vote and get our friends and our family out there to vote do you know what's going to happen we are going to hear nothing but impeach 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 trump impeach that's all you're going to hear for the next two years or until they do impeach him out of office and then everything that we fought for and let me tell you something what you need to know is you did fight the deep state when we won in 2016 and we put Trump in the White House, we did, we defeated the deep state. Now, in November, if we do not, do not show up and we do not make a red wave happen, then guess what? The deep state wins and they get their chance. They get their chance to get back in there because you know what they're doing right now? They are, they are fighting like hell to prevent Kavanaugh from being to the Supreme Court. They are fighting like hell because that is a major loss for them. Now, let me tell you something. It matters. Now all of you, we're all busy. We all work jobs, we have families, we have so many things to do, but it matters. And I'll tell you something. I don't wanna be one of the people that is looked at later on, years from now. And I don't wanna be one of those people that holds it over my head that I allowed America's freedoms to slip. I refuse to wear that on my shoulders. I refuse to carry that burden. And I don't think any of you want that either. So it is so, so important for all of us to rally together because the deep state hasn't given up. You don't understand. They don't really care about Trump being in office for four years. You wanna know why? They've been there for much, much longer. Okay. How do you tear down the greatest country in the world? And America is the greatest country in the world. We have so much more than we know. But let me tell you something, many Americans have forgotten. They have forgotten that the power that we have as the American people is so much more than any people in any other country in the rest of the world. And you see, here's the problem. The deep state wants you to believe that you're too busy, that you're weak, that you can't make changes. They want you to think that they can take care of you. They want you to think that you need them for your health care. They want you to think that you need them to help make decisions and handle responsibilities in your life. But that is exactly how you tear down America. You make the people weak. And when you make the people weak, you can control the people. What they want is they want to control all of us. And they want... <laughs> they want to control all of us and they want to take away our freedoms one little bit at a time. And that is exactly what they have been doing. So all of you, you need to know the deep state is real. And what you hear in the news media is always a twist of the truth. You see, they take a little bit of the truth, they change the narrative, they show that little bitty video clip and tell you what they want you to believe. They control your opinions, which in turn controls your vote when you go to the polls and you cast your vote. That's how they do it. See, many of the people, the people walking on the sidewalks over there, the people driving down the street, many of the people that aren't here at this rally, they don't care. They're not paying attention. When they walk through the restaurants or the airport or into the doctor's office and CNN is playing on the TVs, their opinions get controlled by the little bit of news that they hear. They think President Trump is a racist. They think that he is a bad guy, but they don't know. They don't know the truth. So here's what we have to do. You have to speak it. We all have to speak it and we have to show up in November and we have to make that red wave happen and we have to defeat the deep state again all right God bless you all
Thank you, Marjorie Green. Are you uh, Q QAnon? Yes. Can I speak to you? Can I no, I'm not QAnon. Oh, oh. Could you tell me what it is? Some great speakers or what that you heard? Joey Gibson, Patriot, Patriot Prayer, then Aaron Sith, and Ashton Birdie and Will Johnson. That person made I'm going to put this on YouTube. Awesome, wasn't it? I'm, I'm going to put and this on with anyone. And then Mark Robinson talking YouTube about channel. Second Amendment, uh, and Lucretia, and Tyler. It's a little awesome, too noisy. Awesome. And then go behind the speaker. I don't want to be able to speak. So, right. here to I'm join sorry. us now is JT Wild. We are lucky, lucky. What? <laughs> we are lucky to have this rocker in the house. He's driven all the way up from Florida to be with us. Welcome the amazing JT Wild. She asked me how to introduce me. I said, amazing uh, uh, will do. Uh, amazing. <laughs> How's it going so far? How do you like the demonstration? I'm enjoying it very much. Yeah? What's the best part been for you? Reminding us about the flag, our freedom, that they're trying to take away from us. What's your attachment to the flag? I'm 71 years old. That's what I can say. You're 71? 71 years old. Guess how old I am. Really? Yeah, guess how old. I'm not that old. No, you're not. I can tell you're younger in the face. I, late 50s, early 60s. You're very, you're about 69. Really? I just turned. That's just great. Turned. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up. What's on the stage is more important than what you're talking about right now. I just want to make a quick announcement. Hey, you guys, would you make sure you're picking up your garbage? This isn't a liberal event. <laughs> When we get done, we leave our area clean because we own the environment. We also recycle. We care about the environment, don't we, people? They don't have. They don't. They don't have uh, the the only. That's right. right to the environment. So make sure we pick it up. We leave this area clean. This next group of people. Do you see these pictures? This is what family separation looks like. I'm so sad to introduce them, but these are the angel families. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Ann Mendoza. My son, Sergeant Brandon Mendoza, was killed May 12, 2014. Michelle Root and I founded angelfamilies.com. We need your support. Um, you're about to hear stories from families and loved ones who have become collateral damage to the swamp in DC. We don't want any of the rest of you to become collateral damage, anybody you know to become collateral damage. This has got to stop. We have got to stand up as Americans, demand a secure border, demand increased, um, increased interior um, security, and we need to start supporting our law enforcement, make sure that sanctuary cities are abolished. That's what needs to be abolished. Thank you guys for coming out here and listening to our stories. My name's Eileen Smith. This is my husband, Zach Smith. We live this nightmare every day. 
And for those of us in the parenting process, we can all attest to sleepless nights with a newborn in the house. But let me tell you, in our situation, it's even more sleepless night without them home. My husband and I were headed south uh, through New Mexico when an eight-time drunk driver, illegal alien, who had gotten three uh, prior DWIs on a suspended revoked license, flipped a U-turn on the freeway 10 feet in front of us, causing a collision. My side of the car made first impact going 70 miles an hour. I was in labor pinned inside my SUV. It took four men to get me out of my car and into an ambulance where Dimitri was delivered via emergency C-section. He died just one minute after he was born due to massive head injury and bleeding on the brain. Awesome, awesome. We still had to sign the petition to build the wall and then um, any donations help us stay on the road. I buried my son Dimitri three days before my 26th The petition is to build the wall. The petition is to build the wall. Build a fucking wall. I agree with separation. that fucking statement 100 percent. And then we have a free Trump 2020 sticker for you. Okay, here you go. This is for you. Oh man, I've been dying to get here. Oh, thank you. So I don't want to miss it. I know I missed it last year. My name is Arlene Sudak Cohen. But we got My here son, a week too doing? early. Right, Deputy Chief Fire Marshal Sandra Cohen, Captain of the Rockville Volunteer Fire Department. We've been in all 48 states. His story is the same as. Margot Wolf his widow and his mother, Mrs. Wolf, who's standing next to me, they were both killed together. Sanders started his career in service to his fellow Americans when he was 15 years old. He joined Civil Air Patrol where he received the first of many citations bestowed upon him in his lifetime. All were for serving the citizens of the state of Maryland. When he was killed, he was only 33 years old. He supervised 12 Maryland fire marshals in the Department of Maryland State Police and was the commander of the Northeast Region of Maryland. As a fire captain, he was a mentor to many and a friend to all. There were over 1,600 people at his funeral. My husband, Carlos Wolf, my husband of 12 years and the father of our two small children, was a supervisory special FBI agent. And um, he actually was born in Venezuela and came to the United States with his family when he was eight years old. Carlos loved this country and he worked very hard. He was loved by many and I have received letters from around the world describing how his work impactly imp impacted and dressed, uh, I'm sorry, his work directly and positively impacted other law enforcement agencies. On December 8, 2017, Carlos was involved in a single vehicle crash. Arlene's son, Deputy Chief Fire Marshal Sander Cohen, came to Carlos's aid by stopping his personal vehicle to assist him. Both men were standing on the shoulder waiting for police to arrive when they were run over by Roberto Garza Palacios, an illegal who overstayed his visa since 2009. To our utter disbelief, Palacios was not even tested for drugs and alcohol. He also did not apply the brakes as he was driving along in the fast lane and his car was found to have faulty brakes. Um, we are sure that he was, he was drunk. There is absolutely no way that he was not driving under the influence. Uh, on top of this, Palacios was no stranger to breaking the law. In 2015, he had two DUIs. He took a metal bar and smashed the window of 16 cars at a Dunkin' Donuts and also smashed the window of the Dunkin' Donuts. He had possession of cocaine and he was given uh, two citations for endangerment of life, property, and person because he drove on a sidewalk. In August of 2015, ICE requested that Montgomery County, Maryland hand him over so that they could assess him and determine whether or not they would deport him. Montgomery County, Maryland officials did not honor that request. Unacceptable. Unacceptable, exactly. And they let him go 
and he went back to work. Then, for killing Carlos and Sander, the Maryland State Attorney issued his fine. Do you know what the fine was for killing our two loved ones? A charge, a negligence charge that carries a $280 fine. That is all he received. Yes. We are outraged over the leniency and the lack of justice for an FBI agent and a Maryland State Fire Marshal. So then finally on May 3rd of 2017, I did arrest him. Bail was set at 30,000, but yeah, but then when he appeared before the judge, it was reduced to 15,000. Someone paid the bail and he is now free and he is out on